Ambassador Curry, you say that women, peace, and security, this is how we win. How impactful has the strategy on women, peace, and security been over the years? Where have you seen the biggest impact? I think of women like Retno Marsudi and the, the leadership role that she plays in Indonesia and um, women around the region who are really showing that women can lead in national security and foreign policy issues and that they can do it uh, standing on their own feet. And the other place where it really sh shows me where I really see the big difference is in a place like Afghanistan where women have reclaimed their rights over the, the past 20 years and have very, um, are now at the forefront of the fight for women's equality and to preserve their, their hard won gains in Afghanistan. I think that we now consider these issues to be um, instrumental in, in achieving lasting and sustainable peace. We talk about how progress has been made over the last 10, 20 years, but that progress is not happening fast enough. In your view, what are the biggest uh, hindrance, I suppose, to women taking up that leadership role, like you said, that's happening in countries like Afghanistan? That's not happening in Indo-Pacific in a bigger way. Male leaders who are accustomed to doing things on their own terms see it as a threat rather than understanding that it's, it actually helps to make things work better, that, it, that including women makes, um, makes decisions work better. It, it helps to introduce elements that ensure that peace processes are more sustainable and more durable, that they address underlying root causes and aren't just about silencing guns, but are about addressing the grievances that led the society to break down into violence in the first place. So I think that this, it's, it requires a real shift in mindset to get people to, to understand that, that power is, is not a, a fixed thing, but that it is something that, that grows with the, the people who are participating and that you gain by including more people in a process. Ambassador, as part of the U.S. Global Peace Initiative, women are encouraged to participate and lead in peace operations. How do you see women involvement being key in uh, peacekeeping operations, how does it change the dynamics, the possible outcome? Well, peacekeeping is one of those areas where we've seen tremendous improvement, but yet when you really put it in perspective, you still see how far we really have to go. But we do see countries in the Indo-Pacific region leading. For instance, India put forward one of the first all-female peacekeeping units in South Sudan, and they've had a tremendous impact. And when you're talking about security, especially in a conflict-affected or crisis-affected context, um, you often are dealing with women and children and issues of, 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 of serious challenges that women may not, um, whether it's about sexual violence or some of the other challenges that women face in these contexts, that they may not be comfortable going to a male peacekeeper. As you mentioned earlier in our conversation on a more personal level, you've always been committed to human rights and you've spoken out against reported abuses in China's Xinjiang province, for instance, against the Muslim Uyghurs. And you say practices show pervasive pattern of targeting women. What's the basis for that observation? One of the most persistent aspects of what we what is happening in Xinjiang is an effort to kind of break what we would call breaking down Uyghur identity and targeting um, the, the family connections. So you see things like, um, you see obviously the mass large scale detention of men and, um, and between certain ages, which disrupts family life. And then you see women left at home with children and then um, Chinese party cadres sent to live in those houses, in those female headed households in a way that just sets up um, a, a very permissive environment for sexual abuse and exploitation. And then you see women in, de in places of detention where they are, um, where they're arbitrarily detained. They don't have due process. And again, these, um, these conditions generally are ripe for abuse. We also have seen very credible reporting about the use of extremely coercive family planning and population control methods, um, similar to what has been used in the past 
as part of the one child policy. And it's being done at a time when those practices are no longer being used um, in the with the Han majority. And it calls into question the motivation that this is not really about um, about family planning, but it's about something else. So what's the way forward, Ambassador? You've criticized the United Nations saying it lacks the curiosity about reported abuses in the province. What's the way forward if indeed these atrocities are happening? We are taking specific actions to put U.S. businesses and companies that do business in um, that, that have business connections in Xinjiang and do have supply chain connections in Xinjiang to please look at their supply chains and make sure that they are not being implicated, whether it's in forced labor or human rights abuses. And that the, the burden is really on them at this point to, to prove that, they, that these things are not happening. So we just are trying to get um, UN agencies get the High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle ba um, Madam Michelle Bachelet, to, to take seriously. She's been waiting for more than two years to visit China and to visit Xinjiang to, you know, the Chinese claim there's an open invitation, yet there's never been a convenient time in two years. Um, because the High Commissioner for Human Rights is insisting on her own modalities and the, the established modalities of the the um, Human Rights Council and the Human Rights Commissioner's Office, the Chinese are, have not been able to come to terms with her. I think that, again, is very telling that you, you see the, the, how the extent that they're willing to go to and also the narratives that China is pushing out to try to convince people that what they're doing is a legitimate counterterrorism or legitimate poverty alleviation strategy. 